Good morning. Uh, this is February 11th, 2024. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class where we were going through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations. We're in the book of Leviticus, Genesis, Genesis, bless my heart, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We're in Leviticus chapter 17. Um, I've read so many commentaries about Leviticus because I, well, I want to hear what everybody has to say because I don't, I may not be right. Um, some of them lose track of the story that God is telling. Just reminding us that the children of Israel decided to stay in Egypt. God brought them to Egypt to feed them during a time of famine, but also to dazzle the world because there's food in Egypt, like there's a worldwide famine. And I don't know if it went all the way to Africa and North Pole, but certainly in that part of the world, in the Middle East, uh, huge famine. Only place where there was food was in Egypt because somehow they knew in advance the famine was coming. And so this is, good morning, Susie and Marilyn. So this is uh, supposed to be a, a stunner for the world. Like, how, how did they know? And what's it? Oh, Joseph somehow got, he, had, he was able to interpret a dream and, and people were supposed to go, which they did. Wow. The, 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 their God, the God of those Israelites, he's smarter than all of our gods because none of our gods told us right? But then they were supposed to leave and go back to the promised land. They chose to stay. And it was just J Jacob and his few kids, his few kids, he had 11 kids uh, that he brought with him. The 12th was already there. But they grew into hundreds of thousands over that time period. And that hundreds of thousands of children of Israel all they did was learn Egyptian gods. That's why they weren't supposed to stay. They did not want to leave. As we read the book of Exodus, they did not want to leave. Conditions had, they simply wanted the oppression to stop. They had a nice parcel of land that Joseph had given them in Egypt. It was fertile. It was great where they were. They didn't want to leave. God had to allow the oppression to get so bad that they finally wanted to leave. They, they wanted the oppression to stop, but they didn't want to leave. Finally, because they wanted to go. And at the time when it got so bad, he sent them Moses because it finally got so bad that they could go. But for 200 years, they're there learning Egyptian gods. There was no temple. There was no synagogue. All they saw for 200 years were Egyptian gods. And that's what they learned. And that's what God is trying to correct in the wilderness. That's what he's trying to correct in the wilderness. So he tells Moses, tell them you're going to come three days journey to worship me. Because you're worshiping these other gods. It's not like the movies um, show how there were these faithful people. Go down, Moses. And, and they're, they're waiting, why won't God send a deliverer? Well, someday he shall bring a deliverer. They were way into worshiping Egyptian gods. When Moses did lead them out, they complained instantly. They weren't saying, oh, we thank you, that, oh God, that you have let. They complained instantly. Why did you bring us out of here? We were happy back there. They, they did not want to leave. They weren't these people who were waiting to meet the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. They were not these people who were just waiting to go into the promised land. They wanted to go back immediately. And God's trying to retrain them in the wilderness. They had bought into the Egyptian gods, so much so that when Moses went up to talk to God in the mountain, they said, well, let's build a God and go back to Egypt. They, they were into it. And so God is trying to correct their belief system. That's what the book of Leviticus is about. The entire book of Levit Leviticus is about changing their belief system and teaching the children of Israel how to worship him. And so every chapter is correcting 
their worship patterns. There's not anything else. But we've taken these chapters to mean something else and they don't. So the first chapters, he says, here's how you worship me. This is how you bring your peace offerings. This is how you bring your, your produce offerings and your burnt offerings and your sin offering. This is what you do. This is what they mean. Now he's going to the, this is what you don't do part. Don't do this uh, because this is what the Egyptians do. And so you have to know what the Egyptians do and you have to know what the surrounding nations do to know what he's talking about. Don't do what they do as far as how they worship God. So he built a tabernacle and says, this is how you worship me. He's not talking about every, he's not talking about how you do your taxes. He's not talking about road rage. He's not talking about anything else. You have to interpret all of these scriptures, all of them, in light of their worship patterns, because that's what he's referring to. He just built the tabernacle where they're going to worship. What else would he be talking about? Had he built them a car, then you can see, now when you get in the car, this is what you do. Or when you do... He had just built a temple. There's nothing, I mean, the tabernacle where they were supposed to worship him. And now he's teaching them how to worship. Don't do, the, don't do their worship practice. Do these worship practices. Um, people want to apply these scriptures to something else. Well, now God's talking about, nope, he never stops. He never stops. Never stops. Their whole history, the thing that always got Israel in trouble, their entire history, was worshiping other gods. That's what got him in trouble. Not these other little things that we try to think that God is trying to make a point of. And I'm not saying these other. Th I'm not saying road rage is correct, or uh, you know. I'm I'm just saying that's not what he's focused on because that's not what's going to destroy the mass of people. And he tells them, "I've got to preserve you alive. The Messiah has to come through you. So these are the things that will get you killed." And and because he can't write the. 3,500,000 5, other sins down. Let me write these major sins that will get you killed as a people. So first of all, worshiping other gods, that's going to mess you up. So let's look at it in chapter 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron, to his sons, and to all the children of Israel and say to them, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded saying, whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat. Now, he's about to uh, tell them what they can, how it's wrong to kill an ox, a lamb, or goat, which doesn't make any sense because he just spent the first 12 chapters telling them to kill an ox, a lamb, or a goat. So there must clearly be uh, a specific context that he's talking about. It's not wrong to kill an ox, a lamb, or a goat. It's wrong to do it in this specific context, again, of worship. Uh, some people want to say, see, you, we can't ever kill any animal. Now, it certainly is wrong just to walk around killing animals just for no reason. But God allows it for certain reasons and does not allow it for others. It's, it's a sin if you do it for these reasons. But if you try to take this and make it a blanket, all killing of animals is wrong then you'd be incorrect. That's not the context. Again, that's not a license. Oh, I'm not saying, well, I can just walk around just shoot animals. Yay, I'm free. No. <laughs> we have to look at the context. When, it, when is it okay? When is it not okay? Uh, the word kill, whenever a man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb, this specific word kill means slaughter, decapitate. Uh, it's, it's what would you would do if you're about to sacrifice the animal. So if you're driving down the street and a animal runs in front of your car accidentally, you accidentally kill an animal, this is not about you. You, you didn't kill that animal. And of course it was involuntary. You didn't, you, you didn't slaughter, this talk about slaughtering an animal. Okay. The biggest, Chapter 1, verse 5 says, He shall kill, that same word, the bull before the Lord, and the priests and Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So 
he's using that same word slaughter in, in regard to you're killing it before the Lord. You're slaughtering it for the purpose of a sacrifice. And he shall lay, uh, Leviticus 3, 2, he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the door. That word kill, because there's other words for kill. This particular word for kill means slaughter as though you're doing it for a sacrifice, right? To kill it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and Aaron's sons, the priest shall sprinkle the blood all around the altar. Leviticus 4.4. 4. He shall bring to the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. So that's the type of killing that he's talking about. And I just want to be clear because if you, when we read the next sentences, somebody might think, oh my God, if you ever kill an animal for any reason, God is going to send you to hell. No. But I do want to read this a few, three other verses where this word kill is used that's not in regards to an animal, but it still means slaughter. It means slaughter, right? Decapitate, slaughter. It's a specific type of killing. Like you're going to sacrifice it. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 40, Elijah has just had a context with all the prophets of Baal. And let's see which one of us really has the true God. If you can bring down fire from the sky, then we'll worship your God. If my God rains down fire from the sky, then you've got to worship this God and we're going to have to get rid of you. So, of course, Elijah wins because their gods are not real. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 40, it says, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed it. Now, they translated it, executed them. It's the same word, killed, and killed them there, but it's an execution-style killing. It's that same word. It wasn't pretty. It, it, he slaughtered them there because they had been offering these food to all these idols and worshiping all these idols and all these horrible things, all these idols. And so we're going to make you a sacrifice, you prophets of Baal, who are leading the people astray. Again, the prophets of Baal, this was in this point, not another culture. This was Israel, northern Israel, who had these prophets of Baal. Uh, and the people were very gullible uh, in that they would Worship these prophets of Baal, even though God said, no, have no other God. The reason the Ten Commandments starts with, thou shalt have no other God before me, I'm a jealous God, is because it, the first five of the Ten Commandments is all about how to worship God, and the next five is how to treat your neighbor. Jesus says you can sum up all the prophets in the law in love the Lord thy God with all your heart and love your neighbor. Because that's, that's how you divide up. Now, there's a whole bunch of other sins, personal sins, it's not mentioned there. There are definitely sins not mentioned there because here's what's going to kill you. If you start worshiping other gods and you go at war with your neighbor, that's going to destroy you as a people and I must preserve you alive. So these are the things I'm going to focus on God is saying to the children of Israel in that time period. Doesn't mean it's okay to do all the other things. It just means this is, this is what I'm referring to to keep you alive. Uh, but the people still loved worshiping some other gods, loved it. I don't know why. They had the only true God, but they were always tempted to worship these other gods. Well, they didn't have personal Bibles that they were carrying every day, but they could see these other cultures, these mighty cultures that had grown up, that, that erected these great statues to their gods, and it just seemed like, well, that looks like, that, it's, I guess, the same temptation today. We know the true God, and yet people are always tempted to worship other things. Well, let me check my horoscope. Let me do that. And I'm not saying horoscopes of the devil. I'm just saying there's something in the nature of God that is not immediate, that's not like instant answer. Now, we want instant answers. So we look to anything that's going to give us an instant answer. I'll have my lucky rabbit's foot. I'll have my, you know. And so it's just something in us that just always tempted to look to other things as opposed to look to God first. Okay. In 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 7. So it was when the letter came to them. Um, a letter came to the people in the north saying, 
you've got to stop worshiping and doing what this terrible person is saying to do. And in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 7, it says, So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's son, because the king was leading them astray again. This is 2 Kings. That, that was first. This is a different king. And he slaughtered, that's that same word, kill, slaughter, kill, 70 persons, and put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. Same word, means slaughter, execute, right? So when it says if you kill an animal, it means if you, that you're slaughtering them for a specific person, purpose. You're executing them. If, you, if, you, if you're doing it in that way, here's what you have to then do with the body. That's what he's starting out to tell us. Um, ex, ex, this is the last one. Ezekiel 23, verse 37. The prophet Ezekiel warns the people. So they've been in Israel now for uh, 500 years, right? 500 years they've been in Israel. They made it back to the promised land. They're still worshiping other gods. The people are all still worshiping other gods. In, in Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 37, it says, For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. And that's not a euphemism, because they would use blood in their worship of other idols. And that's what chapter 17 of Leviticus is all about, the blood. If you kill an animal, what are you going to do with the blood? They have committed adultery by worshiping other gods, and blood is on their hands. They've committed adultery with their idols. So just in case you thought he was just worried about adultery, he's talking specifically about idol worship. And even sacrificed their sons whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. In their practices, and he's talking about the children of Israel, blood is on their hands because they use blood in their sacrifices in a way that God did not tell them to which we'll get to, but yes, they drink blood in their, okay. And they sacrifice their sons and put them through the fire to these gods that aren't even really gods. And yet they've talked themselves into thinking, in order to get this God to love me, I must drink the blood of my children and I must uh, put them in the fire. And they're doing these crazy things. And God's told them in the first place, here's, here's, Here's how you worship me. Don't do it the way those other people are doing. And they're still doing it. Moreover, verse 38 of Ezekiel 23, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. So we talked a couple weeks ago about things that they would do inside the sanctuary in order to fertilize the land with various bodily fluids. They did this in God's sanctuary. So not, not going to other sanctuaries, they brought those practices into the sanctuary uh, in verse 39. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it. And indeed, thus they have done in the midst of my house. After they've killed their children and put them in the fire, they would take their children's blood and let it drip on the altar. So that's, this is why God's very specific. Here's here's what you need to do. This is what I will accept. Don't do what other nations do. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 3. So, whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or a goat in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. The guilt of bloodshed that he mentioned back in Genesis after Noah got off the ark. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. So in this verse, if you kill an animal inside or outside and don't bring it to the temple, you have shed blood. And that sounds like you can never kill an animal unless you bring it to the temple. So if you go to the grocery store... And you and somebody has killed an animal, and you buy meat, and that meat was not brought to the temple, then you can't eat it. But it's not saying that. But that's what it seems. If if you try to make this some general rule about all see and whatever you kill an animal, if you don't bring it to the temple, God's going to kill you. He's 
So he's specifically talking about, that's why I went over the word kill. If you kill an animal, meaning you're slaughtering it for, the, for, the, for a sacrifice, like, like, like he slaughtered those people. If you're slaughtering an animal for the purpose of a sacrifice, you have to bring that sacrifice to the temple. If you just are making up your own sacrifice in your own house and you're sacrificing to some other god, that's bad. If you're doing it for me, whether you're doing it inside the camp, where you or you've got or I've sent you outside the camp, if you're sacrificing an animal, because this is all in the context of worship, just like when we get to Leviticus 18, it's all of it in the context of temple worship, then you will be cut off if you are having your own private sacrifice to other gods. Now, it doesn't say, but that's what it's talking about. Obviously, it's not wrong to kill an animal to eat it. You don't have to bring every single animal you kill to the temple. They read this in the context of, oh, he's talking about temple sacrifice. If I'm, if I'm, sacrifice, if, if I'm doing something that involves worship of God, of some God somewhere, but it's not the true God, I don't bring that to the temple. Instead, I bring it to some other God. Instead, I have some uh, little hidden idol in my tent that I'm slaughtering this animal and worshiping. You'll be cut off. I, I will kill you. Because you're, you're going to be worshiping other gods, which they did. That's what I read in Ezekiel. They were killing their children, putting them in the fire. It's like, do you not understand that these, this other idol is going to lead you to do horrible abominations? So if you're doing this act as a form of worship, you better be doing it for me. If you're doing this act because you're hungry, okay, and it doesn't go into all of that because they've read this, the book of Leviticus is like one book. They know from the beginning he was talking about, here's how you worship in the temple. Therefore, Leviticus chapter 17 is also about, and here's how you worship in the temple. Therefore, Leviticus 18 is also about, here's how you worship in the temple. And if you do this thing in the temple, everything's involved in the temple. It doesn't switch in Leviticus 18. And next week, your brain's going to argue with me. But I'm telling you, it doesn't switch. Okay. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 5. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifice, which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the, to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting to the priests and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. That's what you're doing this for. Do not do this for other idols. If you're sacrificing and killing an animal for the purpose of sacrifice, if you have to put your animal to sleep, in essence, you've killed that animal but you know your uh, your animals got injured in a car accident or your animals horribly ill and you know sometimes we have to put the horse to sleep or the dog to sleep you know because it that's okay god's not oh you can't you can't put an animal to you can't kill an animal unless you're going to bring it to the he's only talking about in the context of if you if the reason you killed the animal was to sacrifice it you better be bringing that sacrifice to the lord if the reason you had to kill the animal was because it was in horrible pain and you had to put it to sleep, you're not doing it for the purpose of a sacrifice. So you don't have to bring that to the temple. If the reason you're killing the animal is to eat it because you have to have food, you're not killing it for the purpose of sacrifice to some other God. So you don't have to bring it to, so he's, he's always, God's always looking at the heart. What, what's the reason you're doing whatever the act is? And all of these things have to be interpreted in light of worship because that's what Leviticus written to the Levites it's called Leviticus Genesis is the book of beginnings Genesis Genesis means beginnings he, here only thing I'm going to be talking about is how we began in Exodus means to exit only thing I'm going to be talking about in this book is how we exited Leviticus is written to the priests it's about worship only thing I'm talking about in this book of Leviticus is how we worship so in the context of worship, if this particular act happens in the context of worship, you better be worshiping God. Okay. 
verse 6, And the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So that's, if, that's what you, if, if you kill an animal for the purpose of sacrifice, bring it to the Lord. Leviticus 17, 7. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. So just in case we're wondering what the context was, wasn't talking about any time you kill an animal, it's talking about any time you, you killed an animal for the purpose of offering it to a demon. Now this word demon, you, in your Bible it may say to goats. In some Bible it says demons, and in some Bibles it correctly says goat demons. Because Egypt had a goat idol. Uh, you would recognize it from, and a lot of cultures did. Now there was something about the goat, just the personality of a goat, period. Lambs are little cute, little, but goats will, goats will try to knock you down. And people like that. Ooh, I want that type of goat energy. And so they created a goat god. The Egyptians created a goat god. The Greeks, you know him as Pan. That same word that's translated demons here is basically the Greek equivalent of satyr, satyr, S-A-T-Y-R. You've seen it in Greek literature. That's the goat god, right? That's Pan. Egypt had one. Remember, the whole bottom of it is a goat, then a man's chest, and then a, a, and face, and then horns coming out. That was their goat god. He says, they shall no more offer sacrifices to their demon goat, to that demon goat. Your, your Bible will say demon or goat. Some Bibles say demon goat, because that's really what we said. Don't offer sacrifice to that anymore, because they were doing it. The children of Israel, while they were in Egypt for 200 years, would sacrifice to this goat demon. It says, after whom they had played the harlot, this shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Do not sacrifice to the goat demon. Now, again, so Pan, the satyr, uh, Pan had the hind quartered legs and horns of a goat. He's often recognized as the god of the fields, groves, wooded glens, and often affiliated with sex. So when you See in the Bible says they tore down the high places, they tore, they tore down the glens, they tore down the, the um, altars they had built in the woods. This was to worship Pan, this goat god, and they would have sex in the woods and sex in, because they were fertilizing the earth and, they, and then they were shedding blood. And they just believed any bodily fluid they had was holy. That's why God's saying, no, it's unclean. He's not saying it's unclean. He's just saying it's not holy. You're not, it's not any holier than you. You're, you're, stop acting like your blood and all these things are holy. Stop it. Stop, stop sacrificing your children. Stop sacrificing to these goat gods in the wilderness. Tear all that stuff down. And they would build it up a month later. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pan is connected to fertility. And, and so they connected with their blood sacrifice. They connected sex with it. They connected all these things together. Again, he's talking about in the temple. Um, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 15, just remind us that as soon as they were, had left Egypt, he says to them, I'm sorry, actually verse 14, um, for you shall worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you to eat his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You, you, I know if I take you out of Egypt, you're gonna be tempted because every nation around you worships idols. You're the only nation that worships the true God. None of them, there's no nation on earth that worships the true God. It's only, I only spoke to Abraham, then Isaac and Jacob, your father. And then you guys are worshiping the gods of Egypt. And as soon as you step foot into the other lands, all you're going to see are huge idols, these other lands. And their, their people are going to come and seduce you to worship their gods. Don't do it. Well, they did it. 
for 40 years in the wilderness after God gave them the book of Leviticus, like in year two, he said, here's how you worship me. Let's look at year 40. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16, it says, they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. And he's talking about for the 40 years we were in the, in the wilderness, even though I said on year two, don't do it. By year 40, they were doing it. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. Meaning in the temple, they would do all the stuff I said, don't do. They're drinking blood, they're having sex with gods, they're doing all sorts of stuff, right? They sacrificed to demons, it says in Deuteronomy 32. Not to gods, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Meaning not just the gods of Egypt, but the gods of the Moabites and the Amorites and, and, and uh, all these other, oh, look, there's a new god. And so their God showing up in fire in a cloud of smoke above their tabernacle was not enough. Something in their brains went, oh, but that God, but they've got a God. Well, they must know. And so this idol worship was a real thing. All of it is about your temple worship practices. It's not about anything else. So yes, if you, if you kill an animal for the purpose of food or because you had to put him to sleep or whatever other reason, that's, this is not what this is talking about. It's only talking about if you're killing an animal for the worship of purpose of worshiping it and using it for worship, then you must bring it to the temple. Not all animals that are ever killed through the history of time must be brought to the temple. Just the ones that are being killed for the purpose of worship, you have to bring it to the temple. Don't bring it to those other gods, please. When Joshua led them, after that 40 year period, and Joshua leads them, over the Jordan, over the Jordan River, he warns them to serve God. And in Joshua 24, verse 15, he says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the side of the river, that means Egyptian gods, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now that's that famous phrase, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, but he's doing that in the context of, are you going to serve the gods of Egypt? Are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites we just got here? Or are you going to serve the Lord? Because they've been serving these other gods, which they love to do. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 8. Also you shall say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers that dwell among you who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting to offer to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. So if you... No matter what type of, uh, of sacrifice, don't do it privately. Don't do it to these other gods. Bring it, if, you, if it's not for me, you better not do it. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And whatever man in the house of Israel are the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. Now, is this talking about any time you eat any blood? Well, again, this has to be Interpreted in the light of what the entire book of Leviticus is about. It's about temple worship. It's not saying you can't eat any, you know, you got to get all of your food well done. If there's any blood in it, you can, you know, if you prick your finger and you lick the blood off your finger, oh, sorry, you're going to hell because you ate blood. Not, it's talking about the practices of the Egyptians who would drink blood on purpose. It, it has not, it wasn't even just this blood and this meat. They would kill an animal drink, and drain it and drink the blood in front of their gods because their gods demanded blood sacrifice. So they would drink blood. They would, all the body fluids that we've discussed, they would offer to their gods. And so that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about, you've got to make sure your meat is well done if you're just having sitting down for dinner. He's talking about if you eat blood in the context of sacrificing to some god because that's what the book of Leviticus is all about i will set my face against that person who eats blood and cut him off among his people now here's an example of that scripture being misinterpreted uh in first samuel saul is going to war with the philistines and he's decided in order to win this battle i'm going to make the people fast all day now god did not tell him to do that that was just a Saul decision. Saul often did not consult the Lord. He just made up things. 
But that's not unusual. People do that today, too. Uh, we're trying to raise money for a new couch for the pastor study. So we're going to fast for a week, and that'll make God do it, I guess, is the rest of that sentence. And but God didn't. The fasting is in order for you to focus your attention on God. I'm a fast today because I really need to hear from God. I don't want to spend all my day cooking and you know, I want to just focus on God. You know, I'm a fast for half a day. It's not to get God to do something. Oh, well, they're fasting. I, I guess I better do I didn't plan on doing it, but they're fasting, so I guess I got to do it. Never worked. Didn't work with Saul. So they're like losing the battle because there are, people are fainting. They're about to faint because, you know, they won some and they lost some. And they're because Saul, don't eat. Nobody eat. In Saul chapter four, in Samuel chapter fourteen, verse thirty-one, it says, "Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, so the people were very faint because Saul said, don't eat.' And verse thirty-two, and the people rushed on the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood, because they were just they were they hadn't eaten. They've been fighting for a couple of days now with no food, fighting for their lives." So they just, they didn't take time, meaning they, they just slaughtered and just ate the, ate it. Now they're not, they're not drinking the blood for the purpose of a sacrifice. They're not, oh, I, we're going to drink this blood to the God of so-and-so who loves blood. They're just starved to death. That's why they're doing it. So you have to understand the context because it says if you eat blood, then you'll be cut off. You'll be killed. So we would expect them to be killed right there in the spot if just eating any blood was wrong. It's always, why are you doing it that God is concerned about? God's not a stupid God. He doesn't just make up rules. Sorry, got to kill you. God, you licked your finger with the blood on it. Got to kill you. It's always why you're doing it. So Saul comes to them and sees what they're doing. And you got to stop that. We got to take this, all these animals to the altar. So God builds, uh, so Saul builds an altar. And the Bible says for the first time, because I'll never talk to God before. Let's build an altar because he's afraid this is going to mess us up. The people, they were eating, drinking blood from these animals because you starved them to death, Saul. That's why. And, and so he builds an altar real quick. And Saul, would, you know, Saul built him an altar real quick. He had no problem with that. You know, hey, let's, trying to fool God. And and then they still are losing. They're losing. And God and Saul doesn't know why. So he says uh, in verse 38, Saul says, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what the sin was today. You'll find out that your sin was wrong. You drank that blood. Verse 39, for as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. We're going to find out. Even if it's Jonathan, my son, we're going to find out whose sin it was that is causing us to lose. Well, it was Saul's sin. But not a man among all the people answered him. They didn't say nothing. They said, okay. Then he said to all Israel, you be on one side and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. This is verse 40. And the people said to Saul, okay, do what seems good to you. We know we're not crazy. We were starving to death. That's why we ate that food, even though it had some blood in it. We weren't sacrificing it to some demon god. Therefore, Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And he throws down the lot to see who's wrong, me or Jonathan, or all those people for that terrible thing they did. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. So the lot fell on them. Yeah, it's one of you that's a sin, Jonathan and Saul. One of you sinned. The people didn't sin. That was God's opportunity to say, yes, I told you that anytime you have any blood, no, in the context of the book of Leviticus, it's only blood that you're using for sacrificing to gods. And that's why you're drinking blood, because that's what the whole book is about. What type of worship practices are you doing? It doesn't change in the next chapter. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 27. He says, thus I will make you cease from your lewdness and your harlotry brought from the land of Egypt, because you're still doing it. Ezekiel's written... 500 years in to the time that they're in the land of promise and they're still doing worshiping egyptian gods they never stopped so that you will not lift your eyes to them to remember egypt anymore i've got to do something to you to wipe you out because you are still worshiping egyptian gods 500 years in in, in second chronicles chapter 11 when um so so david 
has Solomon. Solomon has two sons. I mean, Solomon has Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is just a terrible king. So Jeroboam tries to take over and, and, and uh, Jeroboam says, everybody follow me. And so 10 of the tribes followed him and built their own little shrines up north. But Rehoboam still has their shrines down south where God had told them to build, right? And in verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 11, it says, For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. So the Levites who had been scattered all over Israel because every single province all throughout Israel had one priest. They all left those provinces and they all went down south. Why? For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. So the temple that Jeroboam built up north they said, no, we don't have no Levites up here. Verse 13, then he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons, and that's that same word translated goat demon, and calf idols, which he had made. So they, they, they were cow gods and they were goat gods, and, he, he's make, and they're all worshiping them. That was like not a thing. Like, oh, we'll worship these gods. They still believed. In these gods, so that's why God's spending so much time in Leviticus saying, "Don't do these things," because He can see ahead and knows what they're going to do, and He's warning them in advance. Here's why you're going to get destroyed. I'm telling you now, don't do those things. I see you doing them, but when it happens and you get destroyed, you can't go. Well, why did this happen? Because I warned you specifically, don't do it. John chapter six, Jesus says the most interesting things, because even in His time. They are still drinking blood to other idols. They're still drinking blood, even in Jesus' time, especially up north. And that's where Jesus spent most of his time. And the Gentiles of those other nations who don't know Jesus, but they're listening to him for the first time, their, their practice is still is to drink blood. Their practice is still, during Jesus' time, during Paul's time, is to go in the temples and have sex and and spill their seed on the ground and drink blood and put their children in the fire. They're still doing that in all these other nations. Mm -hmm. Only in Israel are some of them not doing that. And so Jesus says the most interesting thing up north in Samaria, when these other Gentiles from these other nations are listening, he says, I'm the living bread, John 6, 53, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of this world. So he's talking about, you know how manna came down from heaven? Well, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. See how God sent manna to, to feed you? Well, God sent me to feed you. And if you eat of this bread, the bread I give is my flesh. I'm going to give my flesh. If you eat of that, if, you, if you're talking about eating some flesh and drinking some blood, me, it's me that I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, verse 52, saying, how can this man give his flesh to eat? Now, what's he, why is Jesus using these analogies in the first place? It's because these other nations are still sacrificing their children, eating their flesh, drinking their blood. So he's trying to say, me, I'm the flesh and the blood you should be eating and drinking. So Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Now, this felt like, what's he talking about? And drink my, his blood... Jesus is saying this up in Samaria in the north where all these other Gentile nations who still eat flesh and drink blood to these idols. He's saying to them while the Pharisees are there, me, me, drink my blood, eat my flesh. Now, he's not saying literally do that, but the reason he's using this type of imagery is because that's what they were still doing, not because Jesus is crazy. And just, why is Jesus saying us to drink his blood? Because that's what people do still. They were still drinking blood. He, um, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you'll have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And Capernaum is up north. And there's Gentiles wandering the streets as much as Jews. 
And Jesus is addressing the practices that are still going on. Jeroboam was up north building goat idols and calf idols and that they still have those practices. They still have those practices. And so Jesus is like, well, if you want to drink blood, me, me, stop drinking blood to these idols. They're not real. But he's not saying literally drink my blood. He's just using that imagery because that's what they were doing. So Jesus was not, didn't suddenly go crazy. Like, whoa, uh, no, he's just saying, you guys are still doing this me if you if me and the, and then he's going to explain more specifically what he means by that okay leviticus chapter 17 verse 10. so he says don't drink blood verse 11 i'm sorry says for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul so he's trying to give them a con god's giving them a context in leviticus here's what the blood is you're drinking the blood because you think it's going to give you virility. You think it's going to give you life. And so let's drink these children's blood. These children are young and innocent and we'll drink their blood and that'll make us live, that'll make us young. It's like the people looking for the fountain of youth. They're the fountain of youth. We'll drink their blood. Um, uh, and so he's focusing on blood. He focused it on semen in the other chapters, right? Uh, p these are just practices that people were doing in the temple to these gods he's saying i have given you the blood to make atonement for your souls that's 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 the purpose because the life of the flesh is in the blood the blood brings life and i am using the blood as a metaphor that it will bring life that that every time you're sinned the wages of sin is death and so for you to be reconnected to me, to be reconnected to the source of all life, I'm saying here is a blood sacrifice. These other cultures are using blood of actual children. They're, the things that they're doing, they think that, that they want the spirit of that goat. So they're drinking that goat blood. Ooh, I want to be strong and ornery like that goat. Ooh, how, see how strong that bull is? I'll drink his, you, they think that you're getting the spirit of that bull and that goat coming into them. So that's why they're doing these things. Don't you do these things for those reasons. I'm giving you the blood to make atonement for your souls, to pay the ransom. Because when you sin, it's like you're in a prison. The, the blood is the ransom price. Now I'm, I'm buying you back. It's the ransom. But you're not going to get the spirit of that goat or that ox or that lamb that I told you to sacrifice. Its spirit does not come into you like these other cults are telling you will happen. You don't get the spirit of the goat to come into you. The life of the flesh is in the blood, but I've given it to you as the ransom price, life for your death. You, you die every time you sin. So I'm saying life. It's, it's, it's the life that you're getting back, but not literal life, meaning, meaning you're in a spiritual prison and this is the ransom price. I'm giving it to you to make atonement for your souls, to pay the price. That's all that it's for. It's not for anything else that these people are telling you it's for. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, it says, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And, and they didn't have a concept of sin in other cultures. They had the concept of gods that needed to be pleased. And so how do I please this God? Oh, I know I'll kill that person and that'll please that God. How do I become strong? I know I'll kill that goat and drink its blood. But they didn't have a concept of sin. Jesus, God's trying to explain there's a separation between us because of our sins. They've separated and, and the shedding of blood, which ultimately will be the shedding of Christ's blood. That's why Jesus said, drink my blood, my blood. You don't have to kill children or other things. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant, 
So I'm wiping away the old covenant because now that I am here, every day I was trying to show you that a lamb must die for your sin. Every day, once a year in the Day of Atonement, a lamb must die for your sin. And now when John sees Jesus, he says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world once and for all, done. So the, the, the separation is over. We just have to believe it by faith. We don't have to go to the temple every time. But I had to do it for a thousand years every day because I was trying to, com to combat these other nations. I wanted every day for you to go and say, blood must shed for sin, blood is shed for sin, blood is shed for sin. So then when the Messiah shows up, now in the new covenant, it's just my blood that's shed for your sins. And you're done. You don't have to worry about blood anymore. Once and for all, done. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19. What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? No, idols are, because he's talking about don't eat, don't eat food brought to idols. That's another thing they would do. They bring food to idols. Rather that the thing with a Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. Here we are again, back with this demon goat God. And not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. And after Jesus has established, every time we have communion and just have wine, we're not drinking blood. We're remembering what Jesus did on the cross once and for all. As often as you do this, once, once a week, once a month, once a year, as often as you do this, remember, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what Jesus did once on the cross. That's the blood. That's what I was teaching you about sin. Blood is shed for sin, blood is shed for sin, blood is shed for sin. Not the way they drink blood to please this God or they drink blood to get the spirit of the goat in them. He says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord, which is, which is remembrance of the, the, that one sacrifice, and drink the cup of demons because Paul's still trying to talk them out of drinking blood. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Don't, stop drinking blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 12. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Don't do it. And he's talking again in the, in the context of sacrificing, drinking the blood to a demon. Not, oh, your meat was medium rare and there's a little, you know, He's not talking about that. He's not, if you're doing it for the purpose of pleasing some idol god or some, don't do it. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3 through 5 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. So you, you can kill things unless you're killing it for the purpose of worshiping some god. No, that's got to be brought to the temple. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not. So every moving thing that lives, so I, every animal, plus I've given you green things, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Don't just grab something and, because I need you to turn, I need you to learn to respect blood. Surely, don't just kill things for the purpose of drinking its blood. Surely for your lifeblood, verse 5, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I require it. Don't kill a person and just shed its blood. Don't just kill just to kill for food. Every moving thing can be food for you. But don't just shed blood like they would do for the purpose of just shedding blood. Don't kill a person just to shed its blood to think you're pleasing some god. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning if somebody just kills you. For the hand of every beast I required, if you're just killing it to shed its blood to please some god. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will cry the life of man. We don't just you don't just kill for the sport of it, just just but really just killing, just shedding blood to please some god. For food. Uh, but, but not for these other reasons. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 13. Whatever man of the children of Israel, and, and so this law, this is not a new law. He said this to Moses, right? You have to respect life. 
Whatever man of the children of Israel are of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out his blood and cover it with dust. So here's how you treat blood. You slaughter an animal, you pour out his blood, cover it with dust. Don't drink it. For it is life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you should not eat the blood of any flesh. For the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Don't just kill an animal, nor to drink its blood. That's what they do in Egypt. That's what the Amorites do. Don't you do it. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 15. And every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beast, whether he's a native of your own country or a stranger, so here's something different. If you hunted it, kill it, drain it of its blood, and then cover it in the dust. Don't drink it. Now, every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beast, whether he's native of your own country or a stranger, you have to wash your clothes and bathe in water and be, be unclean until evening because I, I want you to know that, meaning if you came across something that was dead, you're wandering along and you came across something, you don't know how long it's been dead. Don't eat that. If you eat it without thinking, you're unclean, stay away from people, wash yourself. I, I don't want you to get used to just stumbling on things. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he, 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 you bear his guilt. You, he, he's just trying to, you can hunt, fine. If you find something that died, you don't know how it died, I just want you to know, you're unclean, so just be careful. But if you're doing it for the purpose of sacrifice, bring it to the temple. Don't do what these other nations do. And with that, we're going to prepare ourselves for chapter 18 because <laughs> it's the same thing. Everything in chapter 18 has to be read in the context of don't do this as far as worshiping some other god, and that's why you're doing it. People take chapter 18 as though God suddenly just changed the subject. Oh, by the way, these things bother me. And then back in chapter 19. Now let's go back to the temple. Chapter 18 is still in the context of this is, these are the practices of worship. And if you're doing this thing for this reason, it's wrong. Okay. Thank you so much for listening in. Uh, and Wednesdays, we are in Luke. And I'll be back on in Leviticus chapter 18 next week. Enjoy the Super Bowl. All right. Oops, save. And then end. All right, bye-bye.